Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, where we will be covering the Distance Learning and Telemedicine Grant Program for fiscal year 2023. Now, it is my pleasure to present our presenter today, Teresa Hunkapiller, Grants Management Specialist with the Rural Utility Service. Teresa? Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Um, it is noon in Central Time, so I um, guess I should say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening want to thank every one of you for joining us. This is the second of our fiscal year 2023 USDA Distance Learning and Telemedicine uh, Grants webinars. And I just realized I had not shared my picture with you. Uh, yes, I do look a little bit older than the one that's on the screen. I will have to rectify that sometime before long. However, I kind of like that one, I might leave it. Uh, we have a really lengthy presentation, so I'm going to cover all of the basics that I can and spend a little extra time on some of the ones where uh, the topic is a bit confusing or a source of questions. So if you don't mind, let's go to the next slide. And I'm going to do just the brief introduction to DLT and eligibility, and we're going to look at completing an application. Then Alexa Petty will go through a live demonstration for you and we will share resources and then take questions and answers. This is a very long session, so we do hope to move through pretty quickly and save plenty of time for questions at the end. So uh, without further ado, let's move right along. Okay, let's go to the next screen. Um, the DLT program was established by the statute in the U.S. Code uh, 950 triple A, that is what uh, created us under law. The regulation that governs us is 7 CFR 1734, subparts A and B. And then of course we published the notice of solicitation of applications on December 1 for the 60 day window that we're currently in. And we, <coughs> excuse me, have given you an application guide the link to which is in grants.gov and is also on our website. So I highly recommend um, you look through these. If you have questions, uh, we're gonna try to cover the most common questions, but the DLT application guide, guide is what we hope uh, between that and the NOSA and the regulation, um, a pretty thorough picture of what we need from you in order to award you a grant. Okay, the next slide, please. Okay, this is the most important. If we don't get this, we've missed a lot. Distance learning for the USDA Distance Learning and Telemedicine Program means real-time interactive telecommunications link to an end user through eligible equipment, and it is to connect to someone in a rural area. Similarly, telemedicine is a real-time interactive telecommunication link using eligible equipment to link medical professionals to residents in rural America. So I hope you picked up on real-time interactive telecommunications link and benefiting rural America. So let's move along to the next. The things that have changed for this year, or we used to use the DUNS number now that has been replaced with the unique entity identifier UEI. If you are already a SAMS uh, uh, registered in SAMS, they will have given you a UEI. We'll cover that a little bit more in a little bit. If you haven't, you will have to have one. Uh, the scoring for special consideration points has changed. We'll try to cover that uh, in a little bit of detail. And we do have that cybersecurity software, if it is directly related to the funding project, is a grant eligible purpose now. Uh, cybersecurity has gotten everyone's attention. So that is being uh, funded now, as long as it is uh, directly related to the funded project. Okay, let's go to the next one for eligibility. Who is eligible has not changed. Uh, basically any organization or tribe or a consortium. And we can spend just a minute on consortium. If you are a formal consortium, the, uh, the consortium itself can apply as an applicant, which would be basically no different than a corporation. If you are an informal consortium, you will have to have 
one of your entities be your point person. And if that entity is going to own and be responsible for all of the reporting and um, maintenance requirements of the project, then we would only have to have one signature on all of the documents. However, if you're an informal consortium and you want each of your participants, end users, to uh, have owned their own equipment and be responsible for their own reporting, then we would have to have a point person and then everyone who was going to be a legal party would have to have all of the um, UEI unique entity identifier information, SAM.gov, and we would have to have um, the signatures of all of those participating. So consortium gets a little bit more complicated. Uh, if you are really uh, considering doing this, I would highly recommend that you speak to your general field representative, which we'll cover that in a little bit. But the uh, consortium is a, a bit complicated. We will do them. We don't mind doing them. Uh, but we need to make you uh, aware on the front end all of the little particulars that goes with that. Okay, let's go a little bit further. The additional requirements, like I said, this has not changed, is a minimum reality score of 20 points. Uh, the matching is 15% of the grant amount. And uh, if you are going to have uh, equipment on or across tribal territory, you must have a tribal government resolution consent. And if you are going across multiple tribes, then you must have multiple tribal government resolutions of consent provided by uh, the tribe. And if you don't, you will not be eligible for funding. This is a criteria that if you are going to be serving tribal lands that you must uh, work with the tribes in order to have their approval to do so. Uh, in the Appendix A of the DLT Application Guide, we do have a sample tribal government resolution of consent. Uh, you do not have to use that, but this is to give you an idea of what we're looking for. And the minimum and maximum amounts have stayed the same, 50,000 and 1 million. So we're ready to go. The grant purposes have not changed. You can acquire or install by lease or purchase eligible equipment uh, if it is leased, the cost of the lease is during the three-year life of the grant. All equipment must be new and non-depreciated, uh, never before installed and used. The um, catch on leased equipment is you will need to explain in your narrative uh, the executive summary and the financial sections of your application how you expect this to be sustainable. If you are leasing and we are only funding the three years life of the grant, how are you gonna keep this going after uh, the three years ends? And that's gonna be the same for everyone, but it becomes extremely particularly uh, important when you're talking about leased equipment. Uh, you can purchase extended warranty license fees and maintenance contracts if they are directly related to the equipment purchased in this project. Uh, they must be purchased in a three-year package or a three-year commitment up front. Um, you, we will not let you just say, okay, I'm going to do one year and then a year later, oh, I'll do one more year. It has to be a three-year commitment if you want us to, per to pay for all three. You can ask for reimbursement and ask to pay those on a one-year uh, per each year schedule but uh, it, it must be bought as a unit at the beginning of the project when the equipment that it is pertaining to is purchased. Uh, acquiring or developing instructional programming, it's a capital asset. Um, this, you can actually lease instructional programming. Again, that will be a situation where you'll have to uh, tell us exactly how you're gonna continue that after the life of the, our what we consider the life of grant program. It's uh, the life of the grant project itself lives on and on hopefully and uh, a lot beyond the three year window. We will also pay for technical assistance 
and in, which is basically instruction and assistance in learning to use the equipment being purchased. There is a limit of 10% of the grant amount that can be used for technical assistance. I'll mention technical assistance again a little later in a different format when I'm talking about what the general field representatives can help you with. But this technical assistance means learning to use the eligible equipment that is being purchased. And a topic that I'm going to spend a little more on a little later into the webinar is the purchasing and installing of broadband facilities. This has not been um, utilized just because there's not been uh, an application where it seems to fit. Uh, we're open to exploring applications with you. However, uh, it is limited to 20% of the grant amount. And it is, it's really based on what we call um, broadband facilities. And as broadband facilities means facilities that transmit, receive, or carry voice, video, or data between the terminal set at each end of a circuit or path. So it would include things like microwave antennas, relay stations and towers, telecommunication antenna, fiber optics cables, repeater, coax cable, uh, copper cable, electronic equipment. Those are all considered broadband facilities. Most of the people who are applicants and awardees for this program already have broadband facilities to their location. If you already have broadband facilities to your location, adequate to meet the needs of your project, then this will not be um, on your radar screen. However, let's say it takes a lot more broadband to operate uh, a live interactive um, x-ray machine than it would be to deliver a simple, and I use the word simple kind of in cheek, uh, a simple phys physics class. Um, broadband requirements would be drastically different. So if you've got adequate broadband for the services that you intend to render, this is not a part of going to be part of your project. This is only if you don't have adequate broadband service. Another caveat to this is that uh, the applicant awardee must own the equipment. And so in doing so, you're required to uh, maintain and operate the equipment, and most people are not in the situation where they want to operate telecommunications or broadband equipment. So let's go to the next slide, please. We will pay for computer hardware, software, audiovisual, monitors, other displays, telemedical devices. I've already kind of covered broadband. I'll mention that again probably before we wrap up, and the cybersecurity. You must demonstrate that all of the equipment to be uh, eligible, all components must be an essential part of the delivery of live interactive uh, education or medical service. If the items you're proposing in your grant budget are not essential to the live delivery interaction of, you know, a person on one end and a person on the other at the same time, relaying information and the end user is not in a rural area, then you're not going to meet the definition of our program. Furthermore, if you have something like a computer and you will have to substantiate that the predominant purpose of the purchase of this computer is for the use in this DLT project, that uh, just because we will purchase computers doesn't mean that we can purchase computers unless it's being used predominantly for this purpose. Okay, let's go to the next screen, please. Uh, ineligible grant purposes. None of the application preparation costs are eligible. No salaries, wages, or employee benefits are eligible. Even in where we will fund some um, of the uh, educational uh, curriculum, uh, which brings me to a subject. I think I passed up curriculum. Would you go back about one or two slides? Uh, go back one more. There we go. Thank you. 
Uh, I jumped right past the topic in the middle, which is acquiring or developing instructional programming, which is a capital asset. I think I said that, but I don't think I uh, extended much definition. This is if you are buying instruction or leasing instructional programming that is already developed. We will not pay for anyone on your staff or affiliated with your staff to develop the programming. Now, you can, you know, outside of this grant program, but this grant program is not designed to pay for operating expenses, including salaries or benefits. So now, if you don't mind, jump back two more screens. I mean, forward, forward, sorry. <laughs> um, so I'll, that is kind of a caveat there on the salaries and wages. I have had somebody come back and say, well, can we pay someone on our staff to do the curriculum or the instructional programming? And the answer to that is no, because this program is not designed for that. We're designed to fund uh, capital assets for the most part. Operating and reoccurring expenses such as your monthly broadband bill are not eligible. And any equipment that doesn't have telemedicine or distance learning as its essential function is not eligible. Plus, we will not uh, allow you to claim any costs that were uh, acquired prior to um, you submitting your completed application. Next slide. Uh, this continues on. We do not pay for building construction, renovation, or alteration. We can pay for a minimal amount of inside wiring just for the equipment that you are purchasing. We cannot pay to rewire um, you know, rooms or facilities. This is just to get the equipment installed and functional. Duplicate facilities already provided. This is an interesting topic that we get some questions on. If you have adequate facilities that are currently delivering distance learning telemedicine or capable of delivering distance learning telemedicine services. Your items are to duplicate or to do the exact same thing in the exact same place are not eligible. Uh, there, you do have to address this in a couple of places in your application. And if you have uh, a school system and you have previously funded your six high schools, and now you want to fund your three middle schools, you can explain that in your narrative and tell us why what you're doing is not duplicating uh, facilities that are already there. I uh, just want to mention if you're doing something for sites that you have already funded through us or through other sources, that you explain very specifically how this is not duplicating facilities because this program is designed to outreach to as many people as possible. We don't want to provide duplicative services to the same people. Uh, projects whose sole objective is to provide a link between sites at the same facility. We do not connect sites on the same campus as the project. Uh, we are connecting people from one distant area to a rural area. And it could be one distant rural area to another distant rural area. But specifically, it has to be at a distance and it has to be live interaction on both ends and uh, the end user recipient in a rural area. And you can find out more about this in the application guide and in the Code of Federal Regulations. And I highly recommend you use all the resources we make available for you. Okay, let's go a little bit further. Now we're going to talk about completing an application. Registration requirements. I mentioned a while ago that you have to have a SAM.gov registration. It has to be active prior to registration. <laughs> My tongue's tangled today too, so that's okay. Prior to registering for grants.gov, you have to have your SAM.gov registration. This can take up to 12 to 15 business days after you have submitted it. So you need to plan accordingly and get this taken care of quickly uh, in the immediate future if you plan to apply for this funding cycle. 
the SAM registration must remain active while you have an award with us or an application in with us. And it has to be, a, um, you have to have certified the financial assistance representations and certifications. If these are not made and um, kept current in SAM.gov, then you're not going to be eligible for our funding. Uh, if you have already um, signed up in SAM.gov, you should know that this needs to be kept current. So you need to go in there at least once a year and update. We want to spend just a minute on the financial reps and certs because just because you've gone in and you've got your registration with them up and current, you're good to go, and you've read through the financial assistance representations and certifications, you may have overlooked one minor detail, which ends up being pretty major. So let's go to the next slide, please. In SAM.gov, you're going to see a question that says, does your entity wish to apply for federal financial assistance? And, or are you currently a recipient or for funding under any federal financial assistance program? The system is automatically going to default to no. If you do not go change that to yes, you have not signed up uh, and certified to the financial representations and certifications that fall under that heading, which this includes a lot of the certifications that you had to sign individually in years past. Many of them have been uh, incorporated into the sound.gov certifications and representations for everyone's convenience. So be sure you change that to yes. Uh, let's go to the next slide and you'll see an example. Okay, this is what your screen's gonna look like. This is where it says, does your entity wish to apply? It's gonna automatically say no there. Please make sure you change that to yes. And let's move along to the next slide, please. And as far as the SAM.gov UEI, SAM.gov gives you or assigns you a unique entity identifier. And if you were already a member they have already assigned you one. And uh, just make sure that when you go out there, go check SAM.gov and make sure that you're active and that you'll you'll need your UEI number to submit information into grants.gov and to sign up for grants.gov, which also takes a little bit of time. So let's make sure that you take care of these preliminary items up front. And I want to make especially sure that you know that the UEI must be for the applicant, uh, and you must use the legal name of the applicant on your application with us. Uh, if your legal name does not match that in grants.gov, please make a note in your narrative, uh, the connection between the name in uh, SAM.gov and your, U, the, your UEI and what you were applying for in grants.gov grants.gov must be in your legal name and you must be able to receive and conduct business and implement the grant project and have control over the grant assets to be the applicant. Some foundations that are set up just for receiving funding are not eligible to actually implement the award if they were to get it. Be sure that the legal entity that is the applicant can actually um, meet the legal requirements of the program, and there is a draft grant agreement out on our website. Okay, one more screen, please. Components of a complete application. All right, this is where we get into the nuts and bolts a little bit. And this, you can read all of these specific items on here. And one of the things I wanted to mention while we're here uh, if you are serving a tribe, there's not specifically anything on here that says where to put your uh, tribal resolution of consent. Uh, if you are going to be claiming special points for serving a tribe, you could include it with your worksheets um, pertaining to scoring. Uh, you definitely need to address it in your executive summary. But as far as where to place it, feel free to put that in supplemental information, which is tab N. And while I'm at it, I will go ahead and mention that 
when you submit this, the only thing that actually gets filled in on grants.gov is the standard form 424. Everything else is an upload. You can upload everything in PDF. Uh, it's highly unlikely that you would bump up against any size restrictions because our application guide gives you exactly what we need in these components. Another thing, if you will, when you upload these items into grants.gov, if you will create a separate PDF for each of these tabs and name it accordingly, tab B, description of project sites, it helps tremendously on the back end when we are reviewing and scoring your grants. Uh, it's very, very helpful. And with the volume that I anticipate us getting, it's going to be a challenge to get through the review and award process before the end of the fiscal year. So please, if you don't mind, do that. When you submit your worksheets, uh, if you would submit them in PDF, but also submit them in Excel, um, we don't require you to do this, but it's very beneficial should we have to strike something from the uh, budget that isn't uh, eligible, then you know if we've got it in Excel, it makes our job uh, go quite a bit quicker. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. All right, the sample worksheets. We're giving you sample worksheets. Uh, they are on the website. They are also attached uh, to the grants.gov notice. And I will pause right here and say that the funding number is, for this application program is 10.855. And the opportunity ID is RUS-23-01-2. DLT. And I can repeat that or we can put that in the chat. But we, we do require the information in these worksheets. We do not require that you use these worksheets. There are a couple of little hiccups that we have found in uh, the sample worksheets uh, on the reality sample worksheet. We are actually, at, and there's directions in the appendix to the application guide. We are asking you to supply the number of people who will benefit at each end user side. And that did not get included in the reality sample worksheet. You can do one of two things or you can do both. You can insert a column between G and H, which is between the column where you would include the name of an adjacent city and the reality score. Or you could just address this in your narrative, how many will benefit from uh, each of the sites. Uh, we do have uh, also a drop down on the reality calculation that we had had in the past was are you uh, adjacent and contiguous to a uh, highly populated area, which we consider 50,000 or more. And that at one time had a yes, no um, drop down option. I see that that did not make it on the sample worksheet. So you can either add that functionality or you can just simply type in yes or no. Okay, let's go to the next tab, please. Description of project sites. Let's talk about this. You have to include the hubs, end users, and hub end users. And we will give you the definition of those. You have to include, this is where we do not have a column, a number of rural residents to be served by each of those sites. That's the column that's not on the sample worksheet. So you can address that accordingly. We do have an appropriate place for the location of the congressional district, city, town, uh, rural area, and what state on that worksheet. And for the congressional district, uh, it can be written a couple of different ways. And there is a layer on our DLT map uh, giving you the district designations. For us, it is easier if you put the two state uh, designation dash and the district number like Texas dash 12 or something of that order. But as long as you get the congressional district information in there, uh, formatting is not going to be a hang up, but it is easy if you do it that way. 
uh, you will be listing all locations that will be receiving grant funded equipment. And the locations are broken up into hub end user and hub end user and non-fixed end user sites. The hub location is where the instruction or medical care is being um, initiated. The end user is where the recipient resides. There can be um, a location that serves as both a hub and an end user. But each of these locations that's going to be included in this application need to be receiving end user equipment or hub equipment. We, we need to be funding something in each of these locations. If you are going to be connecting to a hub that is already fully equipped with everything they need and all you need to do is tie them to the end user, you must explain that thoroughly in the narrative. We do have non-fixed end user sites. And for those, if it is something where uh, you do not know the fixed addresses, equipment's going to be moved from one place to another, you will explain that and you will use the information on the hub for the rurality and the economic need. Again, sample worksheet is on the DLT website and additional instructions are included in the application guide and Appendix A of the application guide. Okay, let's go a little bit further. Let's go to the executive summary. The executive summary is your first chance to tell us what your project is all about, why it's needed, how you're going to address those needs, um, who is going to benefit, uh, explain your total cost, how much is going to be grant, how much is going to be match, uh, where the match sources come from. You do also have to include uh, commitment letters from matching sources if they are not from the applicant themselves. For the uh, executive summary, you also need to tell us if it's distance learning or telemedicine. It can do both. You can have both functionalities, but we need to know what you are calling your predominant purpose. Uh, again, if you are going to be proposing to reduce substance use disorder in a rural area, that needs to be specified in the executive summary as well. Uh, you do not get special consideration points for that. However, uh, there is a separate set aside uh, amount of money to use on projects that reduce substance use disorder. So if you want to be considered for using that set aside amount of money, you will definitely need to tell us how you are uh, proposing to reduce substance use disorder. And that has to be the primary purpose of your project. Uh, and you'll also need to tell us if you are requesting special consideration points in your executive summary and under which category. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. You're going to need to provide us with an overview of your telecommunication system. That's going to be basically give us uh, a verbal depiction of what you are connecting on one end and the other end and how it is connecting um, across the network. Um, you will be telling us um, the number of sites, the description of the sites, all of this. Please make sure you are consistent with your description of sites, uh, project sites, worksheet that you provide us. And please be sure that you stay consistent throughout your application when you are listing hub and user sites uh, on your projects worksheet, your morality, your economic need, your everything you do, please be consistent and keep them in the same order. Uh, it's, it's very crucial that the applicant, re, the application reviewer is able to connect the dots between your worksheets and what you have written in the executive summary and your telecommunications plan and you will need to, here we get again, the certify that the facilities will not duplicate adequate established distance learning or telemedicine service. 
So um, that's going to pretty much get covered in two or three places. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. There is at the end of the executive summary a requirement to provide us with publicly releasable project description. And with that, you need to give us the title, uh, the purpose and the end users and a brief description. This does not need to be lengthy, uh, preferably three or four or five sentences. You will need to tell us the estimated population that will benefit from this project and how you arrived at that number. Let's say you are going to have one end user site and it's going to be a high school and you're going to be delivering um, a second language. And the total population of the high school is 200 and you anticipate 35 uh, to 50 students taking advantage of that second language course you would give the 35 to 50, you would not give us the whole population of the high school. So I, th I think you understand where I'm going with this, but we need to know how you came about the number you estimate. Now, if you are going to be doing a non-fixed end user site that is going to cover a county, then yes, you could use the county population uh, if that's realistic. Now, if you are if you think every single person in the, uh, the county might take advantage of the services that you are making available. Okay, also uh, in the application guide, there is um, a little helpful hint on writing the publicly releasable project description for both a DLT and for, uh, for a distance learning and for a telemedicine. So maybe they'll give you a little guidance and you can also look on our website and see the uh, publicly releasable project descriptions that we have out there for past awardees. Okay, now we're ready. Let's go to the scoring criteria. The scoring is determined and we're still using the 2010 decennial census population and that is uh, also going to be covered just a little bit in uh, at the end of the app, um, webinar because Alexa is going to give you a demo on how to go find this and the end user site is uh, the facility that will be where services will more or less terminate is who's going to benefit. And that's where you will get your numbers. However, when you fill out the reality worksheet and the economic need worksheet and your project description worksheet, give us every single site that your project is going to touch. Do not use the information for hub only sites in your calculation unless it is a non-fixed end user site and in that case you have to use the hub information but we want all of this information on those worksheets um, and i'll stress again that you only use anything that has an end user site in your calculation unless it's non-fixed uh, you will be using both the DLT map and the U.S. Census to determine morality. Again, that will be in the demo. And we do have the link to the distance learning telemedicine um, map that is on our website. That's got a lot of good information, a lot of helpful layers. So um, that will be demonstrated as well. Okay, let's go just a little bit further. This will tell you how you will score as far as rurality. Uh, if you have, if you're going to be considered exceptionally rural, if you have um, 5,000 or under, and then you go all the way up, you're considered urban if you have over 20,000. And uh, then you get into um, continue, contiguous and adjacent to urban areas, which we will cover shortly. Again, minimum morality score of 20 points. If you add up and you don't have 20 points, then you are not eligible for this program. And additional guidance is in the application guide. Again, I recommend you fully use the resources that we've made available. Okay, let's go a little bit further. This is the economic need score. And this is also a sample worksheet we provided. Again, please keep them in the same order that you are on the other worksheets. And 
the financial uh, need of the applicant and the community and the project is reflected in this number. It is part of the census. However, it is not tied to the 2010. So the SAPE information is the newest information made available. And it is the small area income and poverty estimates. And there is a link to this on our website. There is also a layer for this on our web map. So um, we can help you uh, if you have any questions on that, but we've given you pretty good details. The end user site location is geographic specific. If uh, you don't have any site data existing for that, we are going to give you the full 30, uh, consider 30%. And back on reality and the, the economic need, these scores are averaged once you get all of your user sites. Again, only use the places that have end user sites for your score, um, unless it is a non-fixed. But um, if you have something that does not give you a SAPE percentage, then you will use 30. Let's go to the next slide, please. And this shows you uh, exactly where we parallel the percentages. Uh, you're going to get 10 points if it's between 10 and 20 and 20 if it's between 20 and 30. So uh, please include all of that information on your worksheets. Okay, let's go to the next. Special consideration. This is one that uh, warrants a little extra time. This year, the special consideration points are it's a total of 10 points. They don't do not stack and accumulate. You can get 10 points for any one of these. And it is for a project that serve on tribal land, farm worker community, or distressed energy community, or that supports Native American languages, or that supports mental health services. Now for the tribal lands, farm worker communities, and distressed energy communities, these are layers on our website. Um, we also give you the definition of what they are and the tribal, the, the layer for tribes is actually broken out into four layers on the website, on the DLT map. And the farm worker communities are communities where rural, rural utilities, um, rural housing service, farm labor housing program has funded projects. So it's a distinct number of uh, of areas that have already received funding that have been designated as farm worker communities. For the distressed energy communities, those are those that have been deemed the most distressed tier of the distressed communities index. And it's made up of communities that are fossil fuel dependent and um, their economic well being depends on um, support. So those are specifically defined and the layers are there available for you on the map. As far as projects that support Native American languages, those are also going to be um, eligible for 10 points. But in that, you, um, let's go one slide further. Um, there we have the GIS layers on our DLT map. And yes, non-tribal applicants must submit a tribal government resolution of consent, even if they are not claiming special consideration points under that category. If you are serving across tribal land, you must submit a tribal resolution of consent. Uh, if it's not provided, the application is not gonna be eligible and we do provide you with a sample. Okay, let's go to the next screen, please. Native American languages. This is where we are going to try to promote the preservation and the use of Native American languages. You can find out more about this in the Native American Languages Preservation Act of 2006, which uh, lists the languages and it includes the Native Hawaiian and Native American Pacific Islanders. So you can get 10 points for serving there. You will have to state which language you are you know, using to support 
the qualifications of the instructor that will be doing the teaching and the number of students that will be served by this project. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. And the projects that support mental health. You can get 10 points if your project supports mental health, but this has to be the primary purpose of your um, project in order to get these 10 points. And of course, that would need to be explained very uh, in detail in your narrative. Now, to get 10 points, you can get it in under any of these categories. When you go to the con special consideration worksheet, we have it broken down into which category are you claiming your 10 points? Because we know that you could have, you could be doing multiple, possibly even all of these. So we want you to just uh, identify where you're claiming your 10 points and what end user sites that is associated with. But for record keeping purposes, we would also like for you to go ahead and tell us anything else that your project targets, because of course we want to target as many of these as we possibly can. So make sure that your executive summary demonstrates that mental health is the primary purpose if you want the mental health. And when you are looking at the um, tribal or farm worker or distressed community, you only have to have one end user site in any one of those categories to get the 10 points. Again, like I say, we would like for you to tell us, you know, all of your end user sites that are meeting any of these categories. But the main thing is you tell us which one you're claiming your 10 points under and uh, substantiate that and make sure that it lines up with what you're saying in your executive summary. Okay, so, uh, let's go to the next one. Needs and benefits. This is uh, the same as last year. You will be explaining to us why the project is needed and how the project is going to uh, meet those challenges. Um, you need to substantiate and quantify these challenges with data and statistics and tell us why the applicant cannot afford the project without the grant. Um, we need to know that our money is going to the areas that need it most, not just because you can get a grant, but because you couldn't do it without our grant. And you also need to get support from professionals uh, in the educational or health field, uh, supporting the fact that this need is indeed there. And you do not have to repeat any of the economic need uh, statistics and information that are showing on the economic need scoring uh, worksheet. We want you to give us um, more on the ground details, not just the statistics that you're already giving us in the economic needs worksheet. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, need to tie the benefits directly to the needs. Uh, you're going to say, okay, uh, we have a shortage of teachers in um, for higher level math in our high schools. So we are going to connect with a high school that does have the resources and we are going to offer these courses to X number of students and overcome this problem. Uh, if you can give us particulars, that would be great. Um, again, we do not anticipate you um, providing many, many pages of information, just give us really good solid examples of what's there and what you plan to do about it. Okay, the next slide, please. And this is something that often gets overlooked and it's address the local community involvement in planning, implementing the project. Uh, you need to have buy-in from the community. You don't need to just decide to go do a project because you think it's needed. Uh, you need to have community meetings, public forums, surveys. Uh, again, I mentioned earlier, support letters from professionals. Uh, you could get a support letter from your local um, district uh, leaders, your community council, any of those, or even school 
leaders, even school students, could definitely give you uh, evidence that you have included the community in the participation. This gets overlooked a lot. Again, we don't need 20, 30 pages. Just give us a few really good examples of the who, what, when, where, and why, uh, how you have included the community in the participation. Uh, and you need to definitely document um, how the local end users are willing to participate. We have people that says, okay, we're going to set up this telehealth project and we're going to serve 12 rural clinics. But they didn't bother to 12, tell the 12 rural clinics that they were going to do this. And when you get all the way down to the end, the five of them don't want to participate because for whatever reason, they have had a, a, a change in philosophy or uh, leadership. And at this time, they are just not in a position where they can fulfill their commitment to implementing uh, it at their end user side. So be sure that you've got the willingness of the end users and the local community to um, support this project all the way through. We do realize that from the time you send in your application with your agreeable end user sites, that things do change. I mean, we have rural clinics that close, rural hospitals that close. Um, we have uh, various entities where you have a new school superintendent and they do not want to implement the project that the previous school superintendent was responsible for getting. So we will work with you. Those changes like that all have to be approved by USDA, but that will definitely not kill your grant unless you've had 20 end user sites and you come back and only five is willing to participate. Now in that case, you will probably have totally altered the scope of the project and it might, may no longer be feasible. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Matching requirements. The matching requirements have not changed. You have to provide 15% of the requested grant amount. When you have someone provide you with a letter of commitment, they need to state the specific matching amount. They do not need to say 15% of whatever you give them. It needs to say X number of dollars. Should we knock something out of your budget because you have included something that is ineligible, then uh, we will not, or if you've made an error in your calculation and now you don't meet your 15% if they were to say 15%. Um, so there's, there's very particular reasons for specifying the match amount as an exact dollar. Now, if we do come back where there is um, something in your budget where you did not multiply across the quantity times the unit price, and we have to make a correction on that, we will have to reach out to you and make sure that you still can meet the match requirement. But that's pretty unusual. Cash or in kind, we prefer a cash match. It's just easier to process on the front end and the back end. However, if you want to use in kind, it has to be new, non-depreciated equipment with an established value, and it cannot have been installed prior to uh, your applying for the grant. And vendor discounts and equipment supplied by the vendors are not an eligible match. For in-kind, um, you will definitely have to provide plenty of supporting documentation, who it's coming from, uh, invoices basically showing when it was purchased and why it was on hand but not already being used and how it fits like a glove into this project. So those are some particulars on the in-kind contributions. Uh, the matching requirement must be for a purpose or eligible equipment that's eligible for funding. It, I mean, it has to be integral to the project. It has to be um, electronically connected to the linking of a person from one area to a rural area for the delivery of live interactive medicine or education. Uh, we do not require matching requirements for American Samoa, Guam, et cetera. You can see there on the screen. And if any part of an in-kind line item is ineligible for the purpose, then you 
have not submitted information. Uh, you've not submitted your minimum match. So with that, uh, if we change something because you made a mathematical error, we'll try to work with you. But if you have submitted something as an in-kind item as a match, and it's not eligible to, to be used as in-kind, then you've basically not submitted uh, your match re requirement. You're, you're basically submitting us something that we can't consider. So keep that in mind. Okay, let's go to the next screen, please. We are uh, do not allow federal funds uh, to be used as matching funds unless it is specifically authorized in the federal statute or law that has developed the other program. Uh, we'll give you an example. The uh, counties in Appalachia that make up the Appalachian Regional Commission in their statute, it says their funding can be used as match for other federal program uh, programs. That's pretty rare. So um, chances are, if it's from a federal source, uh, you have to be careful. Even if it's from a state source, you have to make sure that that's not just a straight flow through from the federal government. Uh, so be very careful on your source of your grant match. Uh, if you do choose to use uh, federal funding, then you'll need to provide us with a copy of that statute uh, allowing it. And you do have to provide us again uh, a letter saying that the those funds are going to be there. It's available. Uh, there's no limit to or exclusion to how they can be used. And they have to be available at the time of the application. You can't say, okay, I'm going to apply for a grant with ARC uh, and I'll use that as my match. It has to be something readily available when the application window closes. All right, again, I did mention that you have to have letters specifying from someone eligible to uh, commit to the match with, you know, a CEO or uh, CFO of a company saying that they are committing their company to X amount of dollars as a match for your project. Okay, let's go a little bit further. Scope of work. This is where you get into the nuts and bolts of telling us how you're going to fulfill the project. Uh, you explain the goals and how each step is gonna be taken. This includes your capital expenditure budget. And each line item on the budget will have to be itemized outside, you know, what is this line item? You can't say, um, I'm going to get a computer. You have to be a little bit more specific than that. And you need to give us uh, and do not bundle items on your line item budget. Uh, you run the risk. Now you don't have to stretch it out into telling us every nut and bolt. But if you bundle something like something that's considered broadband facilities and with something that is not eligible. Therefore, we can't decipher if it is going over the uh, broadband facility uh, limit. Same thing if it's going over the technical assistance limit. If you include technical assistance for the equipment that's being installed and you lump that together with a maintenance agreement or a contract that we will fund for uh, the three years of the project if purchased at the same time and paid for or committed to up front. You run the risk of us not being able to determine which piece is eligible, which piece does not uh, meet the uh, thresholds of those limits. So do not bundle uh, things that are not of like kind. Uh, we do understand, we do want you to give us some specifics uh, on what you're buying. Don't just say a medical cart, say a medical cart composed of um, XXX um, peripherals. And um, you, we do want you to get some quotes to substantiate how you came up with some of your numbers. Uh, you don't have to get a specific number of quotes and we do not expect you to purchase uh, from the vendor that you got the quotes from or that you looked up their information on the internet. 
your procurement must be done in a competitive manner, and that is also detailed in um, the two CFR 200. And we can delve into that later as far as uh, how you can uh, acquire the equipment once you get the award. Okay, let's go one step further into this uh, financial information and sustainability. This is where I mentioned if you were going to do something uh, pertaining to a lease that you definitely have to get into the nitty gritty on how this is going to be completed. Whereas if you are purchasing equipment, um, we understand that the life of the equipment is usually more than three years that we are funding. But we do want to know how you anticipate carrying this forward. And if there are any other funding items that are necessary to carry this out, but not uh, eligible for our funding, tell us where that's coming from. If it's not, if it's needed to complete your project, and it's not eligible for our funding, therefore it's not eligible to be considered as a match. We need to know that you can fully implement this project. So talk to us about your financial information and sustainability. And um, again, the kind of catch all, identify any other items that may affect uh, feasibility or sustainability. Okay, let's go to the next slide, slide please. And this is the statement of experience. This is just telling us basically how you can or um, will have the capacity to implement this project. It says no longer than three single spaced pages. You do not have to provide us with in-depth resumes of all of your um, higher paid employees. Um, we need to know that your organization is capable of implementing this. And it doesn't mean that they have to have done it before. It just means you need to tell us uh, who's going to do it and how they're going to do it. Uh, if you don't have the experience on staff, uh, what are you going to do to overcome this lack of experience? So you need to let us know all that. And if you did uh, have a successful project in the past, that would be great, but it's definitely not necessary. We just want to know that you can successfully implement the project you're proposing. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And this is the telecommunication system plan. This is pretty important and we do have a lot of people that just kind of glaze past this. And we need to know your system narrative and a map or diagram showing us each end user site, how it's connecting and where it's connecting. And like I said, we need that in both narrative form and in a diagram, and those are also uh, covered pretty good in the application guide. If you do not provide us with a telephone, a telecommunication system plan, we really cannot adequately review and determine whether your project is feasible or not. I mean, we've got to know what you are doing. So let's go to the next slide. Um, this gives you some details on what we need in the narrative, the overall network, scope of work, byline item, uh, justify each pieces of the equipment with, you know, that you've talked with ex technical experts mm -hmm. and that we get back again, that this is not going to be duplicating uh, app, uh, services of an adequate nature. Then you will want to give us the map that gives us a pictorial. It does not have to be to scale, but it does need to show us uh, where the end user sites are and in which state and preferably which county. Um, we need to know where you're located and be able to spot, you know, if, if, we, if it's including two states, then you need uh, the state director letters from two different state directors. So I'll cover that again, but that's another reason for some detail on the map and the diagram. It helps us make sure that we've covered all of our bases. Okay, let's go a little bit further. Compliance with other federal statutes. This, uh, some, this is where I mentioned some of the uh, statutes that you are in, need to be in compliance with are covered under SAM.gov under the financial representations and certifications but there are four that do not get covered in that. And these four we have pulled out 
uh, added to the application and you can satisfy the requirement that you are certifying to these by signing and dating the DLT checklist because these are on the DLT checklist. And you can find this under the to apply tab on our website. Uh, and if you are a consortium without legal authority to contract, each entity will have to provide uh, these sets of certifications. Again, that's another reason I mentioned the consortiums get a little bit uh, more labor intensive. Okay, one of these is the flood hazard. If you indeed are in a flood hazard area, you have to go on and provide us with the support information on your flood insurance, uh, uniform location, uh, certificate regarding architectural barriers and non-duplication of service certificates do not require any additional supporting documents. Let's go to the next slide, please. This is the portion on the DLT checklist that will cover the items I just spoke to you about. And this is where if you sign on the bottom of this, you are saying that you have, you agree with these particular statutes. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, evidence of legal existence and authority to contract with the federal government. This one seems to be a little confusing to people. In order to um, be eligible for these applications for this grant, you must have legal existence. And just because you have a registration active in SAM.gov does not mean you have legal authority to contract with RUS. For a corporation or LLC, anything that is uh, established under a state body, then you will need to provide evidence of good standing under that state body. Usually this can be uh, found directly on the Secretary of State website. So that is pretty simple. Uh, the other one might be a little more complicated if you're an entity that exists under law, such as a school district, a hospital district, a university, you need to provide us with the statute, resolution, or other document that confirms your legal existence, your legal name. Make sure that the legal name on your application is used and you do. Now, if you're doing, doing business as or um, also known as or something of that nature, you can put that in the narrative. That's great. Please make sure that the SF-424 application form has your legal name. Uh, SAM registration, um, make sure that it's active and that you all of the information you provide us has to be that of the applicant. It can't be that of the parent, a subsidiary, a foundation. It has, well, it could be a foundation if they're eligible to uh, apply and receive the grant and implement it. Let's go to the next slide, please. This pertains to environmental impact and historic preservation. So for this, we do have um, an environmental questionnaire. You need to tell us, regardless if you think your project is not going to have an impact on the environment or historic properties, you need to tell us that. Don't assume because you've left it out. It is a crucial part of the application. And if you are doing any broadband facilities, there is a good chance that you are going to need to provide a lot more in-depth environmental impact information. So be sure to take special notice to this if you are applying for any broadband facilities. And um, again, if you're not proposing broadband facilities, you still have to fill this out and give it to us. But um, the filling out basically means giving a statement that since your project is doing X, Y, and Z, you do not anticipate any environmental impact or uh, any effect on historic preservation. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, consultation with the U.S. State Director. Again, I mentioned earlier, if you are going to be serving end users in two states, you need letters of, uh, from the State Director in both states. You need to contact them as early as possible. They're gonna wanna know a little bit about your project and um, there's a good chance that they will ask you once you fully complete your application that you provide them with a copy. The director's 
letter does not have a template. Uh, most of them have done this before, or uh, if they are new state directors coming in uh, after an acting or a previous, there's usually something in the documentation. Um, and they just need to discuss the availability of other sources of funding at the state or local level. And basically this assures us that you have um, met with them or discussed with them so they know that you're applying for this federal assistance through our agency because we all are part of rural development. And again, there's the link to find all of the state office contact information. Okay, let's go a little bit further and talk about the application submission. For the application submission, we have resources and like I say, please use them. We have the application guide, we have the checklist, we have sample worksheets, we have sample tribal resolution, and everything can be found on our DLT website under the to apply tab. We have, you know, there are um, possibilities that you might find something that Hopefully, you won't find anything that contradicts the application guide to the FOA or the regulation. But if you do, you must know that the regulation is the ultimate um, authority on this matter. And I will tell you that if you put something in your budget and it appears to us based on what you have given us in the application uh, description, where it's going to be used, how it's going to be used, and we think from the initial reading that it is eligible and we let it go through on an approved budget. But when you come to send us the invoice and the invoice gives us information showing that it is something different from what you described in your application or you were not clear and we gave you the benefit of the doubt, and if it comes back and the information you've provided us proves that it is not an eligible item, then we will not be able to reimburse you. So uh, try to be very careful what you put on the application. And just because it comes back to you as an approved item on your budget, um, we still can't fund it if we ultimately find out that it is an ineligible item. Okay, um, I'm wondering, do we have one more uh, screen? Yes, indeed we do. The uh, deadline, of course, is January the 30th of 2023 and everything is submitted electronically into grants.gov. Again, the SF-424 is the only form that gets filled out in grants.gov. Everything else are uploaded documents, PDFs, and in the case of worksheets, PDFs, and the um, Excel copies, the cutoff there you see. Um, you must get your sound.gov registration before you can get into grants.gov. And uh, I do want to mention that our GFRs are one of our best hidden resources. Um, they are your general field representatives. The link to find who is in your area will be on one of the final slides after our live demo, but they can give you assistance. This is where I was going to dif differentiate between technical assistance and technical assistance. Technical assistance from the general field representatives are during the application window up until two weeks prior to the close of the window. They can help you with technical questions. They cannot help you write your application. They can't get into specifics because this is a competitive program. The other technical assistance that I mentioned that is limited to 10% of the grant project is learning to use the equipment in the project. So we use technical assistance in a couple of different uh, context, so be sure that you understand, but I highly recommend you reaching out to the general field reps because they are a wonderful resource. Many of them have been in this program for years, and a lot of the questions they can answer off the cuff. We will also provide you with something that we started new this year, and it is the use of a contact us help desk, which is wonderful for the volume of information that we are now uh, sending back and forth with the interest in the program. One thing I did not mention earlier is the amount of funding. According to the NOSA, we have 64 million for this year. We are operating under a continuing resolution for 2023 to be exact. It ends Friday. We anticipate to either get a budget or get another continuing resolution. 
when we finally get the full budget for 2023, uh, we anticipate getting more money. And if it is before uh, we make awards, we hope to be able to use some of that money, if not all of that money, uh, on top of our 64 million. So uh, we do not anticipate another application window in fiscal 2023. Um, we do hopefully anticipate that we will continue to have these in uh, the years to come past that. I believe I'm maybe leaving out some little bit of information that was frequently asked, but if so, maybe we can catch those in the uh, questions at the end. And we are right on time for uh, Alexa's live demo. So Alexa, let you have the floor. All right, thanks, Teresa. I'm going to share my screen. And we'll go ahead and get started with the demo. I'm going to demo how you can find the rurality of your project sites. So to begin, you want to visit the census website, and that's data.census.gov. And on this homepage here, you're going to look for the search bar and select the advanced search option right below. From here, you're going to select the geography option from the left hand side of your screen. And then you'll get a bunch of different options here. You'll select place. And then select the state or territory where your project is located. I'm going to select Alabama. And then you can type in or just scroll through and select the different towns or cities where your project is located. So I'm going to go ahead and choose a few locations. So you can see as I'm selecting these locations, they're populating in the filters list here on the left. If you need to remove any of these, you can just select the X button or you can clear all of your filters if you need to start over. But I'm going to go ahead and use these three and click the search button at the bottom right hand side of your screen. So you can see the census website brings up a bunch of different tables. Over 3,000 were found. We are looking for the P1 table. So instead of uh, scrolling through all of these and trying to find it, we can actually type in the search bar here at the top, P1. And that will pull up the table that we need. You can see that there are three different products available to us. So we're going to click this little plus icon. And then you want to select the 2010 summary file. And this will pull up the population for all of the cities and towns that you selected. So based on the locations that we selected, Anderson has a population of 282, so this would receive a preliminary score of 40 points. Huntsville has a population of over 180,000, so this would re receive zero points. And Rainsville, with a population just under 5,000, would also receive 40 points. And you'll notice I said preliminary score. This is because we still need to check the um, whether these sites are close to or adjacent to an urban area, and we are going to check that using the DLT map. You can find the map on the DLT website under the To Apply tab. So we're going to go ahead and hop over there next. And this is what the map's going to look like when you first pop it open. You're going to see a bunch of different layers that are already turned on, and you can click on your Layers tab here at the top right-hand side of your map. And you can actually toggle these layers off and on so that you can kind of clear off that clutter if you just want to focus on maybe one layer at a time. I do want to point out a few of these in particular because they do um, affect your scoring or eligibility of your application. So we talked about um, getting those congressional districts and you can find those on the map. So you can just click on an area and the window will pop up and tell you the congressional district for that area. We also have our distressed energy communities, which, as you know, is part of the scoring criteria. We have farm worker communities. Uh, we have the economic need and a lot of different tribal layers as well. So you're going to want to take a look at quite a few of these layers available to you on the map. But right now we're just 
looking at rurality. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off all of the layers except for the non-rural areas. Okay, so you can see that the non-rural areas are these yellow areas on the map. We can open our legend and see that is what we're looking at. And we're going to go ahead and type in the place of our first site. So we're looking at Anderson, Alabama first. If you'll remember on our census website, we determined that this should get a score of 40 points as long as it's not adjacent to an urban area. And as you can see here, Anderson is not in that yellow area, meaning that the preliminary score we received from looking at the population on the census website is correct because we're not overlapping that yellow non-rural areas layer and we're not adjacent to one of those areas. Next, I will look at Huntsville. And as you can see, the map just flies to that location that you enter. And we can see that Huntsville is in a non-rural area. So as we determined on the census website, this area would receive zero points because it's in a non-rural area area um, on the map. Okay, at this point, I'm going to turn it back over um, to Lauren to share the screen. We'll go over some available resources to you, and then we'll get into our Q&A session. All right, now we do want to cover some available resources. So let's advance to the next slide, please. Uh, of course, the website, the general field representatives and the contact us are three very, very vital items to help you walk through submitting uh, a top notch application that we can fund. So um, all of the information that was given today is on the website already, the slides, and we will be presenting um, recordings when we have them available. I'm not sure exactly how quickly that will turn around. Uh, even the live demo that Alexa did uh, such a wonderful job on, those have screenshots uh, in the slide deck. So um, you can even go back and take a look at those. So very, very helpful. Thank you, Alexa. All right, I believe we're ready to move into questions and answers. Great. Okay. Thanks, Teresa. We have quite a few questions already in the queue, but please, um, everyone, feel free to keep putting those questions in. We will go um, until 3 o'clock Eastern time. If someone has an existing DLT grant, but need, they need to refresh technology at their hub and certain sites, is it allowable to submit those technology needs in a new proposal to USDA where they're expanding their telemedicine services? That is kind of a gray area that we would need to know a lot more. Um, refresh technology may mean that you have already adequate services because we're trying to fund people who have no distance learning and telemedicine service. So that would be uh, definitely something that you would want to have a pretty good discussion with your general field representative about. Uh, if you are only refreshing equipment uh, at the hub, then absolutely not, because this is funding a project that connects a hub to end users. Now, if you were proposing to replace equipment at the hub and at the end user, then you would have to support, you know, how old it was, what it can do now and what it can't do now and what you need it to do. So that's going to be um, a, something that will we don't specifically provide uh, refresh or even necessarily just updated technology. It has to be something outdated so that you are implementing a new project, basically. Great, thank you. Um, I think we got this question at our last webinar. So can you clarify um, or maybe provide some examples of the specific documentation that an applicant needs for evidence of legal existence and authority to contract with the federal government? 
Yes, we need the statute under which the entity was established. If it was a college, a county, um, a community facility, those type uh, entities. And if you are an incorporation, we would need something from your the state in which you are incorporated showing that you are in good standing with that state. All right, thank you. Under the special consideration points, um, if you check one box, do you automatically receive the 10 points? And why would an applicant want to mark all that applies? So I think we gave them the option to mark multiple categories on the, the worksheet. So can you talk about that a little bit? I will. Uh, if you mark one and tell us which end user site it is, and if it's one that's on the map, um, then we can immediately verify, and yes, you will immediately get the 10 points. The reason we ask for the others is because all of these special consideration points are topics that are trying to be addressed by this administration, and they would like to have as much information on how many of these areas we are able to benefit, and it could play into uh, future special consideration categories, and it could play into us being able to give more points in some categories in the future. So yes, it's a little more cumbersome. You do not get any extra points in talking to us about the other things you're doing that would have qualified you for additional points, but it's information that's valuable to us. Uh, it won't help your score in this uh, application window. So it's strictly up to you whether you want to provide us with additional information, but uh, we have been asked to gather as much information on this as we can. Great, thank you. The next person asks if we can show a sample map accompanied by an overlay of the system plan. I'm not sure that we have any of those samples available. No, but I do believe that that is available in the application guide. If it's not, uh, you can work with your general field representative and they can help uh, provide you with some guidance. Okay, perfect. During the last webinar, it was mentioned that the information should be organized by tabs, and I believe we mentioned this today as well. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what you meant by that, and was this just referencing the spreadsheet? And is it okay to just arrange the narrative by headings rather than tabs? You can arrange them by headings and by tabs. What I meant was under the completing a grant application, we have tab A is standard form 424, Tab B is description of project sites. Tab C is executive summary. Tab D is scoring criteria, documentation. So you, if you don't want to use the A, B, C, D uh, designations, that's fine. Uh, it's perfectly fine to use the descriptions like where, like I say, tab A is standard form 424, tab B. You can use either or, but it is very, very beneficial if you break them out and uh, categorize them under something that is easily recognizable and that we don't have to go through one large PDF and pull out bits and pieces. Um, that's very cumbersome on the reviewers and a lot of our review process is extremely manual. So uh, any assistance you can get helps us meet all of our deadlines. So um, I'm not sure if I answered your question, yes, PDF, uh, worksheets, we would like to have them also in Excel. Did I miss anything? No, I think you got it. <laughs> okay, thanks. Perfect. And if y'all need any more clarification, of course, as always, please feel free to pop another question in. Um, the next question is, are tribal lands defined as land held in uh, land in federal trust? Tribal lands are lands that are designated under the U.S. Code 950, and I don't know exactly how that parallels out to land trust, but everything that is eligible for tribal points or that is um, designated as tribal for this program are on four tribal layers in the BLT map. All right, great. Okay. 
The next um, person asks about um, whether a mobile hotspot for a student or instructor is eligible. Okay, student hotspot gets into another situation. If it meets the definition of our distance learning and uh, all the criteria, if it's used 50% for this project, if it is for the delivery of live instruction, and that's the predominant use, then uh, there is a good chance you could make the argument that this is indeed eligible. However, I would be careful because Wi-Fi hotspot is generally open uh, for other uses other than just for a live class. Uh, it could be for the student that missed a class to go out and watch a recording of the class. Those type things are not considered live interactive. So hotspot, I can't say is eligible. It would depend upon the use. And you also you have to fund equipment at the end user site. So for the for the end user, so I'm I'm not exactly sure. Uh, what equipment we could fund there. So that, that needs a little bit deeper uh, discussion on the particulars. All right, um, the next question, um, again, kind of on the eligible equipment topic, would technology tables with plugs and mobile TV stands be considered eligible equipment? Okay, repeat that. I'm gonna turn my speaker up. I'm having a little trouble hearing you, Alexa. Okay, um, could technology tables with plugs and mobile TV stands be considered eligible equipment? I'm not exactly sure what a technology table is. If it is a live interactive electronically connected component to the network, um, if you could give more information, uh, I might could dig a little deeper into that. Otherwise I would have to research offline. Um, Mobile TV stands only if it is needed to and directly connected with a piece of equipment. We do not fund furniture. Uh, we have funded uh, security cabinets. If you're buying um, computers or laptops and there you buy a specific security cabinet to keep them stored in, locked, uh, it has to be project specific. We can't fund desks, chairs, lecterns, podiums um, of those nature. So uh, I have to have a little bit more information um, that we could dig a little deeper into some specifics. But I think you get the idea. We can't fund um, anything that's not interconnected and essential to the project. All right, great. Um, next up, a question on the match. Can salaries and wages be used as the 15% match? No, no salaries or wages can be counted for anything in this project. All right. Um, would remote patient monitoring devices be considered an eligible equipment purchase? That's going to depend. <laughs> Is it an essential part of a live interactive delivery of medicine? Uh, and is it used 50% or more of the time for live interactive delivery of medicine? Uh, when you say monitoring equipment, again, we get a whole range of uh, ideas. You would, it would have to be specifically what monitoring equipment are you speaking of and how is it being used? Uh, if it does not meet the essential part of the project and it is not used predominantly for live interaction with the doctor, then there's a chance that it would not be fundable. Okay, thank you. Next question, can equipment be used in asynchronous learning in conjunction with synchronous distance learning? It can be used 49% or less for other uh, activities. It has to be predominantly for the DLT project you have proposed. All right, 
The next question is in regards to the farm worker communities layer that we have on the website. So this person wants to confirm that the only area that only the areas in that layer are eligible for the special consideration points. They um, stated that they live in an area where more than 40% of the land is farmland, but they just want to make sure that there aren't any other instances in which uh, an area might be classified under that farm worker community. No, I'm sorry. It's just what's on that layer, and those are uh, particular areas where USDA has funded uh, some farm worker housing. So that's pretty limited. Yeah, we we wish we could open it up to a, a lot of others, but it was you can't really quantify unless you have some set parameters, and that was the parameters that were chosen. All right, the next question, um, if facilities are already offering distance learning services for a different purpose, would the grant be considered ineligible and considered as duplicate um, facilities if they're already providing DLT services, um, even if the grant application is put in for an entirely different purpose that requires more robust technology? That's where the applicant would have to present the case that it is not duplicative. Uh, if you've got equipment that has, you know, that can deliver dual college enrollment courses, and now you want to deliver foreign languages, we would call that duplicative because the equipment could be used for, you know, the other purposes. You would have to make the case that why the equipment that's there does not, uh, is not adequate for doing whatever your new purpose is. We have had people that applied for a distance learning grant, and then they came back and did a distance telemedicine grant. The end user sites happened to be, some of them were duplicative, but it was totally different project. You can't really use the distance learning technology in place of um, telemedicine cart. So you would have to make the case of it being uh, non-duplicative. All right, thank you. Next up again on an eligible project, um, a rural hospital needs vid video conferencing for a room that's used for a bunch of different purposes from meetings, conferences, education, um, virtual education, community meetings, and more. Um, this may also include minor renovations. Because the room is used for multiple purposes that are critical for distance learning and telehealth, is this an eligible project for DLT? Okay, we do not specifically fund renovation. Um, that is, that's not a predominant purpose for this. Uh, even if the room does get used, even if the room were being used uh, 25 to, I mean, 50% of the time for um, those type purposes, we don't fund renovation. And uh, you would lack the, the components of a hub and an end user in a rural area. So uh, that does not fit our definition for this program. Okay, next question. Would mobile learning labs be supported if the applicant was requesting or asking for the tech required on the vehicle and at the hub site? Okay, read that one to me again. Would mobile learning labs be supported if the applicant was asking for the tech required on the vehicle and at the hub site? Mobile learning lab, meaning it goes out into a rural area and students come to that mobile lab and interact live real time with somebody at a hub. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? That's the way I'm understanding it. If, um, if the person that asked this question wants to put any more details in the Q&A, we can come back to this one too, if that's better. Okay, and I will go further and say okay. that if it meets all of those definitions, then it would likely be fundable. Uh, but the wherever the hub is, if it is in a 
an urban area, then it would not be because you have to use the information on the hub for the rurality and the um, economic need scoring. So if if that were the case, even if the end users are in a rural area and you have to use the hub information, then it might not uh, be eligible or it might not score high enough. Okay, great. And again, if um, the person that asked that question wants to put any more details in the chat or submit um, some more details through contact us, that um, would be great. Okay, the next question, for education, would, locate, would the location of each end user be the actual location of each student that's enrolled? Okay, no, that would be a non-fixed end user site and you would use the hub information for scoring. We, we do not want and cannot house and or store um, personal uh, proprietary information as in students' addresses. Great, thank you. Next question, are middle mile or fiber infrastructure deployments that create connectivity for broadband facilities that are used for distance learning or telemedicine eligible? Does the main applicant have to own and operate the new infrastructure deployed? The broadband um, piece of this is only if the applicant has to have it to get connectivity. We do not build middle mile. We do not, uh, you cannot use it for any, well, it has to be used mainly for this program for 50%. And yes, the applicant has to maintain it and operate it. I'm not so sure I covered that very well, but um, this is not to get internet service out to a location unless it is a site that is in the project. Great, thank you. Um, the next person is asking about the um, rurality calculation worksheet. They said it's not allowing them to type in a response in column F. So I would say um, that you can add an additional column because these um, worksheets can be manipulated. Teresa, if you have other um, guidance on that, but that was just my first thought when I saw this question come in that if it's giving you an error, then feel free to create a new column, just title it the same thing and put your yes or no in that column. Right, yes. And uh, those are just sample worksheets. And there was a worksheet in the past where that was a yes or no drop down. And with the sample being revamped this year, apparently that got overlooked. But you can uh, insert a new column and put yourself a drop down in if you want to. Uh, and delete that column. You can manipulate it any way you want to, but we need that information, however you choose to give it to us. I had hoped maybe to get a revised version put on the website, but I realized that that means the version on the website won't match the version on grants.gov, and it's not advisable to change anything once you put it on grants.gov. So uh, we will leave those sample worksheets there and you can manipulate that to put that information in um, as you see fit. Great, thank you. Does the economic need poverty um, percentage account for lower income areas that are located in a county that has a university on the other side of the county? Um, their area is really low income, but because they have a university um, close to them, the income is always showing as a bit higher than it actually is. Okay, the same criteria takes in, it's by county, and so it's going to take everything in in that county. This is where you would um, present us with the economic criteria for your specific area and explain that in the narrative and in the needs and benefits section. Um, you might have to um, give us some additional information in connection with the um, economic spreadsheet in order for you. I mean, if it's going to throw you to where you're not eligible for any points at all, then um, 
we'll have to work out a way for you to give us that information. We don't want you to um, not be eligible just because there is something located in the county that is disrupting the, the true picture. So in that, that would be one of those that would be detailed in the narrative and in the needs and benefits. And it would also need to be captured in some fashion on the economic needs uh, SAPE worksheet. You, that would be a really good one to talk offline with your general field representative. Okay, great. Um, the next question is, the slides and application guide are clear in the instructions about special consideration points. However, neither of these say anything about opioid use disorder as a telehealth priority, which would presumably be a subset of special consideration points for projects that support mental health services. Is there any other advantage to a telehealth DLT application that also serves opioid use disorder populations? Does the USDA have a special set-aside DLT fund for such opioid use disorder telehealth projects? Yes, there is a set-aside of 12 million out of the 64 million that is for substance use disorder. And that would that is not a special consideration point, but if your project does target uh, reducing the effects of substance use disorder in rural areas, then you can ask for the money to come from that set aside money that is designated and, if you will, kind of locked down just for those type projects. That's why they're not in the special consideration points. It's because they have a total set aside money for them. So you can basically, you're going to be computing, competing for um, with a lot fewer people for that specific uh, set of money. Great. And then also, if you look in the application guide, I just wanted to point out on page um, 14, talking about the executive summary, um, it does request that you include in a statement specifying if the project is going to um, serve um, for that type of project for an opioid use disorder telehealth project. So you can see more information on that in the application guide. Okay, the next question we actually already answered. Okay, if an applicant applies for special consideration under one criteria, but they also meet another criteria and include it. So this goes back to earlier, we were talking about you can select all of those criteria that your project meets, will you automatically apply the second criteria for the points if you determine the primary selection is ineligible? So for example, if the applicant applies under mental health, but you determine that their project is not primarily mental health, will you automatically apply points for the distressed energy community if they also fit that criteria? Very good question. And yes, yes, if you are targeting more than one and we deem that one of them you didn't meet, then yes, indeed, we would definitely. All you have to do is meet one of them. That's another good reason for telling us everything that you might be uh, addressing. Good point, thank you. Great. Okay, the next person says that they are seeking funding for course fees for a remote work professional cert uh, certificate. The curriculum is developed and includes one hour of face-to-face -face instruction per week and about five to seven hours a week of asynchronous work on the course website. Is this an eligible project? I'm sorry, it's not. We do not pay for coursework. Uh, there's a difference in coursework and uh, actual curriculum. Uh, we don't pay for fees like per hour or per course or per person. That's considered basically an operating expense. Okay, thank you. Is there any page limit to the overall application? Um, they know they saw that um, the statement of experience should be no longer than three single space pages, but is there a limit to the overall application? No, there is no limit. Uh, I would recommend that you keep it as brief as possible, yet 
provide us with any information you think we would need in making a, an educated decision on whether this is a complete project and fundable. All right. If matched equipment was donated, how would the applicant prove this um, within their application? For the donation, we would have to know the source uh, of the equipment and have to have something to establish the dollar value of it and uh, certification that it was new, non-depreciated, and uh, never installed. And the non-depreciated, let's just say you've got something in inventory. Well, if it's been in inventory two years, I'm not going to consider that new. So you would need to provide us basic, the best support would be an invoice. And uh, you would really have to kind of tell us why you have that on hand uh, ahead of time. I mean, we, we would accept it, but um, if you're going to go out and purchase something, um, you can just provide the invoice after the date of uh, the submission of the application, assuming that you're you know, taking the risk that you may or may not get an award. Um, that could be considered a cash match if you were just going to pay for it like that off of an invoice. So in-kind gets a little different because when you submit for reimbursements, in-kind has to be um, calculated differently because when you have a cash match, we just, you submit your invoices um, cross-referenced to your um, budget and then we send you back the federal percentage. Uh, so that's real cut and dried. When you get into um, in-kind match, then we have to get into it a little different calculation. You still get credit for the whole thing, but it's just not as simplified. All right, thank you. Another question on matching. To start to satisfy the match, can an applicant begin buying equipment starting the day after the application submission deadline, as long as it is aligned with their budget that was submitted with the application? You can, as long as you're willing to take on the risk that we might deem that it might not be eligible um, as part of the grant. We might deem that you know it's used for something other than DLT uh, more than 50% of the time. Um, there's, you know, if you are very confident in, in what you're going to purchase, yes, you can purchase them as long as the invoice is dated after the close of the application window. All right, thank you. Um, another question on matching. <laughs> Do you know if counties located under the Delta Regional Authority can use funds from an organization from that organization for matching funds, um, such as the ARC, ARC funds? I don't know, but I think the answer is yes. Uh, I think they are uh, very similar to uh, the Appalachian region, the ARC, um, but you would need to check um, actually with the Delta Region Authority. I think you can use those funds. I think that's about the only other uh, federal fund program that I would think might be eligible. But just check under their program. It should say, um, you shouldn't have to dig too deep to find that out. All right, great. The next question is, um, if there is a hub in one state and an end user in another, um, are you saying that applicants have to have two USDA state director letters? We have to have state director letters from the states in which you have end users. If that first hub is a hub end user, then yes. Uh, but if you only have end users in one state, then that is the state where we would need the state director letter. All right. The next person asks, if we serve tribal communities, but the project is not on or over tribal lands, could it still count towards the special consideration points, even if it doesn't count towards special consideration points? Since they are going to be serving tribal communities, but aren't on or over tribal lands, do they still need to get the tribal government resolution of consent? 
Okay, I'm not quite sure how you're defining a tribal community that is not on tribal land. Uh, that would be a deeper conversation. Uh, the areas that we require a, we do require a tribal resolution for anything that's on the four map layers on the DLT map for tribes. Uh, if it's something that is not on there, you would definitely need to speak to your GFR. I don't think we would require uh, a tribal resolution for anything other than what's on tribal lands on those four map layers. Okay, great. Um, with that, I'm just going to answer this one last question because we have about a minute left. Um, someone asked if this recording will be available for review. The answer is yes. Um, the recording from last week's webinar will also be available for review in the coming weeks, and that will be posted on the DLT website under the To Apply tab, where all of the other uh, documents we've discussed today are also available. Um, with that, I'll turn it back over to Lauren. Thank you, everyone, for attending today. Please have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.